Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights, and I appreciate you tuning in. This week's guest is Seth Eilberg, who is the head coach at the Hill School located in Pennsylvania. Seth has been there since 2001. He's a former D3 basketball player, and during his time there, he has placed kids at Ivy League schools, uh, schools like Vanderbilt, Northwestern, Cornell, Colgate, and um, all other levels out there at the college level. And in this episode, we talk about um, what it takes to be a D1 guard, uh, the transfer portal. He talks about the uniqueness of the Maple League, which is the league that Hill School plays in. We talk about some famous alumni, and he shares his story about LaMelo Ball and the Big Ballers brand showing up on campus to play them. So thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep at Lives podcast with our guest, Seth Eilberg. Thanks so much. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Seth, welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Good to have you on again. Thanks so much for having me, Corey. So 99% of the kids that reach out to you and to me are guards, right? Um, it's basic supply and demand. So with that many kids reaching out to you that play a position, what do you look for when you recruit and go after guards for your program? Well, I think in, in terms of what we're looking for at the Hill School, um, whether it's a guard or a forward, uh, any of our players, the first thing we're looking at is, you know, are they a good teammate? And, um, you know, certainly do our, our homework there and you're a great resource uh, for schools like ours as you get to know the kid and families in a more intimate way, build a relationship with them, get to understand what they're about and thus, you know, tell us what that student athlete's strengths and weaknesses are. But I mean, when you walk in our team room at the Hill School, the first thing you see on the wall is great teams have great teammates. And we're very serious about that being what uh, we're all about and uh, more important than position or you know, can they, you know, what percentage do they shoot from the three? Um, we want guys that are great teammates. And if, if they're great teammates, uh, it probably means that they're going to respect their teammates, their classmates and fit in, you know, to the school community, most importantly, uh, as well as our team. And when you're um, a kid, if you're looking in particular for just one year as a postgraduate, um, you know, it's really important that you have those pieces in place because we're not going to have four years to help you um, figure all that out. We need you to be able to hit the ground running. And that's going to certainly translate to then the basketball court stuff that we value, which is, you know, giving up a good shot for a great shot. So making the one more, the extra pass, um, the willingness to slide in and take a charge because the teammate got beat, um, you know, uh, stuff like that, that, you know, helps you win games, uh, but also makes for a great experience, uh, you know, for, for that student athlete and his teammates. Gotcha. And over the years, you've placed guards at the D1 level. What did those guards possess that guys that didn't go D1 didn't have? Yeah, I mean, we, we've got several guys playing at the college level right now, um, you know, and, and at different schools and levels, a little bit based on maybe their preferences. But, um, you know, and it could be some of their physical attributes that, you know, made them a better fit for, say, Division One, Two, or Three. But, um, you know, Chase Audige is starting at, at Northwestern right now. He's a 6'4 guard and, you know, one of the most athletic players we've ever had in our program. And so I think when you have that level of athleticism, it allows you to defend uh, at the Big Ten level. Um, you know, we've watched him, you know, play over the last couple of years and guard some of the country's best players successfully. He's an outstanding defender, uh, above the rim guy. So, I mean, certainly that athleticism, um, is going to open some doors to play at the next level. Um, you know, I think at the same time, your ability to shoot the ball, we've got a, a 6'6 guard at Vanderbilt, uh, Gabe Dorsey, who, you know, was with us for four years and really developed the other parts of his game over four years really well. But his ability to shoot the basketball certainly separated him and, uh, you know, led some of the country's best programs to recruit him. And, uh, you know, thirdly, I think sometimes it can be just IQ, especially if you're a point guard. Um, you know, Zach Lazanik's playing at, at Army, a really nice 
you know, program and obviously one of the, the most incredibly special, you know, institutions for leadership in our country. Um, but what made West Point recruit him was his intelligence, his basketball IQ savvy. Um, he didn't necessarily have chases above the rim athleticism. He's not 6'4". He, he wasn't, you know, uh, shoot, shoot from NBA range, 6'6 guard. Uh, but his toughness, his savvy, his ability to make others better, um, you know, led led a Division One program to offer him a position in their program. And Seth, of all three schools you just mentioned, all three are high academic, right? So that helps as yeah. well to having good grades. But you mentioned an athletic player, a shooter, and then one with high IQ and toughness. So it's not cookie cutter. You, you can have a combination of that stuff, but if you have grades, you're obviously going to have more options than someone that doesn't as well. So that's that's good you shared that. Um, tell sure. us about the Hill School. When you talk to families for the first time that know nothing about your institution, your program, kind of give me the elevator pitch on, on your program and why should a kid come play for you? Well, yeah, thanks for that opportunity to share. I'm always excited to share about the Hill School. It's become home for us. My wife, Donna, and I have been here 21 years. Um, my son uh, is graduating this year. We'll go on to play uh, next year at Ursinus College down the road. Uh, my two daughters are in school here now. We're really proud that uh, parents um, that we get to send our kids to the Hill School. Um, and what has made this our home and what's kept us here and what I would say um, is certainly more than a pitch, but authentically what um, has been so special to us to be a part of this community. And now again, as parents of students in the community and um, why I'm excited to share uh, why you should come to the Hill School and then be a part of our basketball program is that, you know, for one, as you mentioned academics, you have an opportunity at Hill to play at the highest level of prep school basketball uh, and get one of the best educations uh, that's out there in this country. Um, secondly, you know, you're going to do it with kids from, you know, over 25 different states and 25 different countries. And it's just um, an incredible way to prepare for college and then your life uh, to be able to live with and go to school with kids from all over the world is really special. Uh, and finally, I think our emphasis on developing leaders, developing teammates, I don't think it's an accident that so many of our graduates, you know, over 80 since I've been here in the last 20 years have gone on to play in college. And many, many of them have gone on to captain their college teams. Hmm. Um, you know, I think that's something we really take seriously. We owe it to our students across the board to develop leadership skills and our, our players as well. And, and that whole emphasis on being a great teammate, finding a way to lead, whether you're a captain here or not, um, you know, those are things that you will get out of being a part of Hill and Hill basketball. No, that's great. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, the Maple League. Obviously, we talk a lot about NEPSAC in New England and everything they've got up there. But the Maple League is special in its own right. Tell me about the Maple League or tell people that don't know about it, you know, a little bit uh, of background, the schools in it, and, you know, what makes it special versus – or do it that first, then we'll go kind of head-to-head -head comparison with New England. Sure, sure. So speaking just about the Maple League, you know, we're a, a small league, six schools, Hill and Mercersburg here in Pennsylvania, and Blair Academy, uh, Lawrenceville, um, the Hunt School of Princeton, and Petty in New Jersey. Um, I think, you know, uh, like I mentioned, I've been here 21 years, and I think I'm, I'm climbing the ladder, but I'm the third most tenured coach in the league. We've got, you know, um, great institutions and places where you know, coaches want to come and stay and build special things. And certainly across the board, um, there's a great camaraderie with our coaches about, you know, a student athletic, you know, model, student athlete centered experience for our kids. Um, and so it's, you know, good competition each year. We've got really good players and good kids, good coaches in the league and uh, play a high level of basketball. Uh, the league tournament's always, I think, uh, you know, a must see for college coaches. And, um, you know, the, the other aspect to the Maple League as, as it regards postgraduate students is that in our league, uh, you're allowed to, to in, in, you know, roster two postgrads for the Maple League games. Um, with that in mind, I think, you know, our teams are built with both, you know, three, four year kids and also you know, the two postgrads that most schools, you know, have on the roster each year. And I think for 
potential, you know, prospective student athletes looking at a PG year, you know that if you're coming to a Maple League school, you're going to have an opportunity to plug in uh, to an impact role in that extra year. And that's important to your experience, I think, as you and, you know, you're, you're advising families. I know you're helping them understand where they can go to both be challenged, but also have the opportunity to impact the program of the year they're there. Yeah, and but let me ask you this. I know you guys for, for a long time have only had two postgrads. It, will that ever change? I don't think so. Um, I think, again, you know, with the way our schools and programs are built, uh, it works well to develop um, players from the ground up. You know, we've, we've certainly got plenty of guys who come through our program and developed over four years. Um, and it's nice to be able to offer that experience to some one year uh, kids. And we try and be really intentional about, you know, at Hill, especially we're, we're really eager to not over recruit mm -hmm. and to make sure that our guys coming in uh, at whatever point along the line, if they have goals to be college level basketball players, you know, we feel like uh, we're going to do a good job in that admissions process of identifying uh, the right kids to have the impact that they want to have in their one, two, three, four year career. Yeah, selfishly, Seth, I want you guys in the league to have more postgrads, right? So we could have more of uh, my kids go there. Sure. Um, and you have to be very selective too. I mean, with only two spots, um, you got a lot of kids coming your way wanting to do that one year and you've got to figure out each year with your team's buildup, what you need, what kind of personality. So actually that's, it, it, it makes it easier that you only have two to fill, but man, it's gotta be a challenge picking the right guys every year. And I'm sure you've had ups and down years with the postgrads you've, you've, you've taken. Sure. Well, it, it is very competitive, uh, both on the academic, you know, that's one of the first, you know, kind of filters or lens. We look through who's going to fit in and, and be successful academically here for the year. Um, you know, after that, certainly in, in, in conjunction with that, the character piece I've spoke about is huge. And um, you're right, Corey, I think, um, there's never been more interest in this PG year. And we can talk about some of what we've seen with the demand uh, or the supply, I guess, of postgrads because of uh, the need for, for extra years, given what's going on in the college landscape. But, you know, it's, it's, it's never been more important for these student athletes and their families to have the support of somebody like you um, who understands the full, um, you know, range of options that are out there because it is as competitive as ever been to find the right home. Um, we do hear from, you know, many, many, many uh, more kids than we could ever take. Many kids that would be a great fit that we can't take. Um, and obviously, you know, our, our hope is that we can help them if Hill's not the right fit for whatever reason uh, on their end or on our end based on positional needs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to help them, you know, along the way if we can. Uh, and often the best thing we can do is, re you know, for, for them is to make sure they know about you know, folks like you as a resource. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. You know, just the thing is it's not for everybody. There's only so many roster spots throughout, you know, the prep school world at legit brick and mortar schools. Right. So it's about knowing those differences and that's what you guys like you do as well as if you can't take a family, you know, at least try to steer them in the right direction. Um, let's go back to the showdown of new England versus maple. Um, one of the big pitches New England prep schools say is that, hey, we've got all these schools within a couple hour radius. Um, if a coach wants to come from the West Coast, they can see all these New England prep schools in the fall based on the open gym schedules. It's just so convenient. Um, you guys are still in a pretty good spot being outside of Philly and you know have, being close to colleges. But what's the advantages or disadvantages geographically to being where you're located versus like a New England prep school? Sure. Well, I mean, for us, um, I can speak specifically to Hill. Yeah, I mean, our, our location here right outside of Philadelphia, which has an incredible uh, depth of basketball talent and tradition. And, you know, um, the, the culture of Philadelphia basketball is really special. Um, it's taken, taken us a little while to break into the scene, but I think uh, people around here now know we're, uh, we're serious about our basketball. And I think even after whatever, 15 years or so, I finally got invited to the Philadelphia coaches, uh, ball founding. I got to go one of these years, but, um, no, I think our location is, is great in that it's pretty easy to get here and get to see our guys, whether that's on the way somewhere else. And there's some really great programs here 
in this greater Philadelphia area that college coaches do come to see. And so whether it's our fall open gyms or some of the tournaments that we're in or just some of the games we play in this area, we certainly see a fair, fair share of uh, college coaches here. The other thing outside of geography that we've done as a league is we are now playing the same rules as that New England double A, uh, NEPSAC double A group. Uh, we play 18 minute halves, we have a shot clock. I think the game and the flow of the game and the style of basketball is, is really conducive to developing our players to be ready for college basketball and, and certainly creates great opportunities and uh, a great you know, opportunity for college coaches to, to recruit our players in that context. It's a dumb question, but why would it be 18 minute halves and not just 20 minute halves? Yeah, I think we, we took the step from eight minute quarters to uh, 18 minute halves. I think a little bit of it was to be consistent with, you know, maybe some of our kind of overlap there with, with NEPSAC AA. But yeah, you know, I think it takes um, some depth to be able to play more than the high school game. I think we have that kind of depth. I'm not sure we were ready to, to go all the way to the college rules okay. and maybe we're headed that way. We actually at Hill played in an event last year where um, three games in a row, we played with three of the better Pennsylvania prep schools, uh, Westtown, uh, Perky Oman, and Phelps in three straight games in this PA Cup. And we did play 20 minute halves in that event even went to overtime with, with one of those. Um, so we played 45 minutes of basketball. Uh, we could do it, but guys were pretty tired the next day. Yeah. Okay. I figured that was the case. Um, let me ask you this since COVID happened, how has college placement changed for you? Yeah, I think that the impact of, uh, COVID on the college recruiting process you know, might be felt most in terms of the fact that a full class, uh, you know, a full cycle of college players have the option to get their year back. And then when you combine that with the changes in the transfer portal, you know, the transfer rules of not having to sit out a year and the, the explosion of college players using the transfer portal, um, you know, I think that has certainly trickled down to what the opportunities for, you know, graduating high school players are going to be at the next level. And so I think if anything, where it's impacted the, the counsel that I'm offering our families as they go through it is maybe not that much different than what it always should have been, which is, you know, you always should want to go somewhere where you're really wanted. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, go somewhere where it's a great fit for you, you know, both on and off the court. And when you find that opportunity, um, don't uh, hesitate to take advantage of that. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure that's different than the advice I was always giving families, but maybe just doing that with a little more urgency and making sure that our players have identified, you know, places, like I said, that are a great fit and that really want them. That's going to lead to the best, I think, um, possible college athletic experience. And I'm guessing now, any players you're taking post COVID, you're probably being very realistic and upfront about the landscape. So they know coming in like, Hey, I might be, I want to, I want to play D one, but based on what you just mentioned, the extra year, the transfer portal, you might need to, you know, temper those expectations. Is that more of a conversation you're having now than you might've had before COVID or have you always had that, uh, that pitch? Yeah, I, I think we should. I think all of us in, in my level, um, you know, we should be, transparent like that with families. I hope my coaching colleagues, you know, would be, I think we owe it to our families. Uh, that should be part of the currency and credibility that we offer. Um, and to do otherwise, you know, really is a disservice to those kids. Um, I mean, certainly you have your top, top tier kids and they have so much division one interest, let's say in a given cycle that, you know, that that's not part of the conversation, but for many more, you know, if you look and say, all right, these are my goals that I'm hoping to achieve in the college recruiting process, you know, when we're talking to our student athletes about that, you know, as much as we can, that should be a conversation that can be detached from division one, two, three, and then say, you know, can you achieve those goals um, at, at these schools if they're not at the division you had maybe thought you were going to play at? And usually the answer is yes. You can find that mid-sized school in the city that, 
you know, uh, sees you as somebody who can come in and have an impact right away at the position you're at, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can go to the NCAA tournament. You can, uh, whatever it is that are part of your, um, you know, hopes and variables that you're prioritizing in your process. You know, as you know, sometimes the, the financial aspect of that process is a driving factor and there are certain uh, pieces to that. But often it's just a matter of educating families that, the money might come from different sources or be a different, um, you know, way of supporting your college education, um, whether that's Ivy versus a division one scholarship or, you know, merit money versus, um, you know, basketball money. But I think, um, you know, we have great confidence that between our college counseling office and Hill, we resource that office with a student athlete college counselor, you know, hopefully, you know, my experience and network from all these years, are an asset to our families. You know, we feel really confident in Hill that we can help you get a you know wide range of options to explore and then make good decisions from there. But one thing I'll say too, Corey, that we really are upfront with our kids about, especially the ones taking one year, is that yes, this is a means to an end. It can open some new doors, and we're excited to be a place that that you can do that. And there've been a lot of real great success stories uh, along the way where guys came with. No division one interest and left, you know, going on to play it wherever. And um, the, the experience in itself, I mean, nine months at the Hill School can be a life changing experience. And you're going to make friends from all over the world for life. And you're most importantly going to be prepared for success as a collegiate student athlete when you leave here. Uh, but you're going to have a great time along the way. And I think um, getting families, kids, most importantly, you know, I say to the kids that we're recruiting and maybe I've scared a couple off over the years and that's okay. Uh, you know, probably help them if, if that's the case, but like, make sure you want to do an extra year. Like for all the reasons you, you, you know, you're not going to just be able to come at least to Hill and only do basketball. Right. So if you're not into all parts of it, you know, we're not the place for you um, to do that. Yeah, there are plenty of places available out there that can scratch that itch for kids too. So I, we got a fun part of the podcast we do now, Seth, called Famous Alumni from Your School. And I, my crack research team, which is me and uh, Wikipedia, went through your alumni list. And I'm going to name off a name. And you tell me if you know it or not. And there's, you're not graded, but I picked three and a half interesting people here. Okay, you ready? Go ahead. Menage Bargava. Yeah, uh, five hour energy. Yes, I love that. I, I I I should invest in five hour energy because I don't like Mountain Dew and all that caffeine and sugar. Well, I mean, I like the caffeine. I don't like that sugar. The five yeah. hour, I feel like, is perfect, and it's. I've been using that since I started coaching in two thousand seven. And it so, and it works for you. I'm I'm stuck on the coffee a little too much, um, but I know they've done well. And one thing, um, you know, we were privileged for him to, you know, speak to our school and. Um, you know, he's just an incredible guy. And I think one of the really cool things about his company is that I believe 90% of the profits of his, uh, you know, super, super successful uh, business go back home to help uh, back home in India. And I think, um, you know, that, that stood out to me as kind of, you know, one of the values that, you know, we're seeking to build in our students and players and that was pretty inspirational hearing all that. How old is he? Is he 40s, 30s, 50s? No, older than that. Um, I've been here since 2001. So, you know, he, he was here before I got here. So okay. at least that old. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Well, good for him. I, I'm a big user well. of his. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone also spoke to the school. Um, Pretty creative, innovative guy and filmmaker uh, extraordinaire. Yeah, Academy Award winner. I knew you knew that one. And yeah. about one trip or trippy, one trip or one trippy. He's an older one. I might have missed that one. He's the founder of Pan Am Airlines. Okay. I don't even think Pan Am even is operational anymore but back in the day that was them and twa were the main airlines globally yeah. so yeah there's been an incredible list of alumni um and you know there's lots of others i i know that uh, the current well the new and, and now current ceo of peloton is um a great 
Hill alum supporter. Mm -hmm. um, and in the basketball world, we have people coaching all over the place. Um, and we've got the famous coach Dick Harder uh, was a Hill alum. His father coached here as well many, many years ago. And um, coach has since passed on. But I, I can remember one of my first years at Hill. It was really meaningful to me that Coach Harder was in the middle of the season as a Sixers assistant. And uh, we had a game and he made time to get out here right in the middle of the season to watch a game of ours. And, um, you know, I was able to pick up the phone the next day and, and give him a call and get a bunch of good pointers and feedback about all the things we needed to do better to continue to improve the program. And uh, I'll always be grateful for that. That was really cool. Oh, that's a great resource. Hall of there. Famer. Yeah, Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the half is that the Trump boys went there back in the day, Eric and Don Jr. Um, that, that can be a plus in some circles, a minus in others. But the, what, how does that perceived at school in this current environment? Well, it certainly got plenty of attention during the, uh, you know, political uh, <laughs> upheaval that has gone on. And, uh, you know, th those guys were here just before I got here, I think uh, may have overlapped with. Eric for just a year. Is that, does that cause, like, does that cause any issues at all? Like recruiting, like knowing they went there. Has that ever that has not up? come up in our recruiting conversations, okay. but um, I'm not the most political guy. So <laughs> I certainly don't bring it up. Well, Ivanka went to Trump, uh, Choate. So, um, and then Paris Hilton went to Canterbury. So it just happens. Um, I just didn't know in yeah. the current zeitgeist how that's been, even talked about so yeah well we'll keep up politics how about that okay. yeah i think that's best that was this week's edition of famous alumni and hill had a whole page dedicated so i just picked out three that were interesting three and a half but um yeah great uh that's big big props to your school for everything they've done throughout the years what is what are your thoughts on the nca transfer rule seth yeah you know I've listened to all the different other podcasts that we all tune into as coaches. And, you know, I'm a big podcast guy, so um, follow yours and others um, as best I can. I, it certainly was talked about on every single podcast over the last year or so. And I've heard the different opinions. I think probably my opinions may be more based on those coaches I hear from at, at the higher levels who you know, have either experienced that, you know, themselves or see what's happening in the college game. Um, and perhaps some of the opinions that resonate most with me are the realities of, you know, what kids benefit from uh, when they do get a year off as they make change. And obviously that then maybe decelerates the, um, you know, eagerness to just pick up and leave because you can immediately jump right into things at the next place. I think the ability to sit out can be a real positive to the academic transition and long-term, you know, development of players. And I've seen that with a couple of our players over the years who've uh, gone through a transfer process um, for very good reasons. Their coaches left, they had an injury perhaps and had to sit out a year. Um, and I've seen the benefits of that extra year. So um, I'm not sure I'm in favor of um, the flip side of this process, which is, you know, basically kind of, um, if you look at it in the worst possible light, rampant free agency. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm equally confident that my opinion holds little weight in the, uh, NCAA transfer, uh, portal conversation. But if you're asking me for my, um, little perch here in Pottstown, I'd, I'd love to see the, the NCAA go back to at least um, for the non-grad transfers. I get it. You you finish your academic program at a school and maybe have outgrown that program in one way or academically because you're at a school that doesn't offer, you know, master's degree programs uh, and have eligibility left. But, you know, I think it's a shame that kids are leaving so much. And I certainly see that trickling down to the prep school level in a way that's not healthy. You know, we kind of, I think as, let's say, high school coaches, prep school coaches have a collective responsibility to help hold kids accountable just in general, whether that's socially, academically, uh, on the court. And I think the easier it gets 
for kids to pick up and go to that new AU team, that new basketball program, that new school, that new college, uh, the harder it is to uh, help them improve, uh, even if it doesn't always feel that way when they're being held accountable to the things they need to improve on. Yeah. Well, it's when adversity hits, like you just mentioned, what are you going to do in the real world, right? You can transfer AU, high school, prep school, college, but once that's all done, like, yeah, I guess you can change jobs, but it's just, it's interesting to see how this is generational, right? Sure. But the thing is too, like, you know, I saw San Jose State play this year. They had five high major transfers, you know, Arizona, Ole Miss, Southern, uh, South Carolina, Ohio State. And there were giants out there. They didn't win a game in conference, but on paper, it looked excellent, right? So I wonder throughout this transfer portal that, you know, we don't, you don't have to sit out a year, like, we're in the middle of it right now. And I wonder if certain programs and coaches are going to say, you know what, we tried that. It's, it's not going to work. We're going to go back to high school slash prep school players. We're going to develop kids and do our damnedest to keep them within our program. I, I just wonder if that's going to happen or if coaches still on these three-year contracts feel that pressure to win right away, if they're going to try to get them in. So we're going to see this in live time, Seth, and there's no yeah. right answer. Because sure. Kansas had transfers, Baylor had transfers. Right. It's helping teams win titles. And, and I think the best coaches are doing both of that. And, you know, I would like to think that, you know, we at Hill are doing, doing well in, in kind of both respects as far as, you know, we build a roster. Um, it'd be hypocritical of me to say that there's not a place for, you know, kids to change schools. There's lots of reasons you should change schools. You know, you're, you're seeking um, – you've outgrown your program and, and you really need to play against better competition or have the resources that we're blessed to have as a program and as a school. Um, and, you know, we do have kids, uh, you know, come in along the way um, in addition to our four-year players and the post-grads who come, who need that extra year, or want that extra year. But, um, you know, I think we're very, very sensitive to that, kind of situation where somebody might be changing schools along the way. I think that needs to be handled really well uh, for that student athlete to one, be successful with the transition uh, and two, to be sure that, you know, um, you're honoring whatever everybody uh, who has worked with this student athlete is doing to help them improve as a person and as a player. Uh, but, but the guys I see doing it at the college level the best are the ones who are doing both and who've built a culture such that even if transfers are coming in, even if their lineup is, has several transfers, and I can think of some great examples, um, you know, they're buying into the culture um, and there's a healthy enough and sustainable enough culture that foundation built there so that a new face or two or even three or four, you know, um, come in and are value added, they fit in, because to your point, you know, it's talent's not going to be enough at the highest levels right. for sure. I mean, it's so competitive uh, that that chemistry and cohesiveness um, and talent, you know, are needed to be successful. Yeah. And I can speak personally, Seth, you know, I transferred high schools um, because it was the right, it, it made sense for me. And I had my dad advising me, who's the OG prep athletics, right? Like he, he'd done that for a while, helped a lot of kids. We made an informed decision and it was an upgrade in my situation. It seems like now that there are a majority of advice given to kids, whether it's in high school, prep school, or college is bad advice. And you'll see guys transferring and be like, why are they transferring? And sometimes it works out. A lot of times it doesn't. Some guys go in the portal and that it, it, they're in purgatory. No one picks them up. And it just, you know, I scream about all the, the pros and cons of prep schools and the difference between brick and mortar schools and pop-up academies just to be educational uh, to families out there looking at, at the prep school route. But like there almost needs to be someone on a, on a soapbox screaming to these college kids like, look, there's no guarantee that the grass is going to be greener. Right. You know, you're you're playing now. You know, it's it's you've got a good situation. There are not good situations that people need to get out of. Right. But I feel like a lot of times kids aren't getting the best advice and I don't know what's causing advisors to give this advice. Is it ego? Is it eventually getting a kickback of an eventual pro contract? Do you have any thoughts on advice givers and like where, what, you know, who should kids should listen to or, or what your experience has been with them? 
Well, I do think, uh, you know, I don't know that I have advice as much as, you know, I think it's clear that, you know, I, I, I think kids today have so many more influences than ever, right? And, and whether that's people or, you know, they're human, they see on social media, everybody else doing something and wonder, you know, am I missing out if I'm not taking advantage of the transfer portal or whatever the move is. Um, and, you know, I think I'm, I'm sympathetic to the kids that they have so many influences, um, perhaps so many voices in their head that it's hard to sort through and know what the right thing to do is. Kids want to please adults and they, you know, um, ultimately are trying to make the best decisions. And sometimes, you know, um, yeah, it only takes one influence in their life that's giving bad advice um, to get them off track there. But, um, you know, sometimes we see things and, and just can't understand it. And there's a reason there that we don't necessarily right. understand, but uh, yeah. And, and I think the other part too, about the, the transfer portal, as it relates to kids making decisions that seem hard to understand. I mean, um, you know, it'd be easy to look at a great story out of the NCAA tournament, like St. Peter's, these guys have really banded together and made this historic run in the tournament. It was so fun to follow that. And, you know, you might, as I did, look at it and go, oh, what a shame these guys are all going to now enter the transfer portal. You know, at the same time, you know, their coach is leaving uh, right. and has, a you know, a special opportunity professionally to advance his career as he has earned and, and should, should take. And so why is it, you know, unfair for these kids to enter transfer portals when, you know, coaches are transferring. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of lenses to look through this with. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we try and, you know, in, in our role at Hill, you know, I am never telling our kids, I think you, you have to play with this AU team or you have to go to this college. You know, my job should be to, and I think Corey, this is what you do a great job of too. You're not telling your kids, this is the prep school for you. You got to go here. You, you know, our job, right, is to try and offer from our experience and, um, you know, network and stuff, uh, a wide range of positive options, healthy options. So, you know, for this kid, these are some AU teams that I think would help you continue to develop where you'd have fun and hopefully get in front of the right, you know, college coaches with the schedule they play for you. And then, as it gets to the college recruiting process, you know, here are some options along the range of where I think you'll definitely have, uh, you know, a spot to maybe uh, reach in a little bit and, um, you know, try and help resource them having as many good options as possible to choose from. And then, you know, being as involved or not involved in the final decision as they want us to. Right. That's all I can do. They have to make their own decisions at the end of the day. So uh, a couple of years ago, you had LaMelo Ball and his team at Spire come through. And tell me about how that came about and what that was like. That, that was different than any game. Um, ironically, it really was a scrimmage. I mean, in, in prep school basketball, you know, you kind of get about five practices and you're jumping right into things. So we try and do one scrimmage. And Spire Institute from Ohio had agreed to come out this way and do some, some games. Their schooling program kind of started a little earlier than ours, and so they were into their games. But, you know, we're going to do a scrimmage uh, with them. And then about a week before uh, we were going to play them, they called to say, we need to let you know that um, we've got a new player, LaMelo Ball, joining us. And there's a number of things that are going to come with that. Um, and oftentimes now when we're talking to recruits or even general students, one of the things that they have heard or seen on the internet about Hill is like all the content out there that the, um, you know, the Mellow Ball uh, machine, uh, you know, film company, whatever it is, has put out there. And so it was, it was quite an event. I'm, I'm, I said, one of our new players at the time as, and they saw a line around the building to get into the scrimmage, uh, said to me, gosh, if this is the kind of crowd we get for a scrimmage, uh, what are the games going to be like? And I said, I said, I, I, I don't think it's going to be like this, but um, it, it was, you know, he certainly turned into an incredible uh, talent um, and uh, it was a fun environment. 
there wasn't a seat in the house and uh, certainly different than any scrimmage I've been a part of. We were up a bunch at halftime and I think they kept, they were kind of getting better as the game went on, learning how to play with this incredible talent. They had a couple other really good players on that team. Uh, Rocket Watts, I remember, had about eight threes from half court against us in the second half or something. Uh, and they came back and won the scrimmage, uh, but it was it was a good experience overall. But um, you know, it, it took a little bit of extra support and management than our our normal game management crew is used to. Right? Did Big Baller Brand set up a pop up shop in uh, your parking lot? Uh, Mr. Ball was there, um, and his team, and and all that, and uh, he was very generous with uh, our students. All thought it was pretty neat. Uh, he'd kind of been at, at the peak of his uh, celebrity status and visibility. And, uh, you know, our students thought that was pretty neat. You know, he made headlines, uh, when one of those kids was in on his team, cause he got kicked out of a game and they got, uh, you know, kicked out of the AU tournament. So they were going to play in a championship game and, and he pretty much forfeited it by being a clown, but he had to do that because he had an autograph signing like in, during the same time as a championship game. And I think he walked away with like 30 K in cash, uh, by forfeiting that game and he got you know headline on espn news you know more people were talking about him so like the guy is uh say what you will he's a genius marketer and the kids actually are nice kids and can play too so <laughs> it's just interesting you got to see that machine come through uh in person so yeah he was still a work in progress there you know Lamelo was not the player we see on tv now uh that day but certainly could see the town there incredible uh athleticism and vision still was working on learning to shoot the ball and stuff like that. But uh, LeVar was well-behaved and uh, it, it ended up working out. It was a, it was an okay experience. All right. We're going to finish up here, Seth, with some lightning round questions. Okay. It's been the yeah. biggest win of your career. Uh, well, that's um, the lightning round means it goes quick and I'm going to take some time on this because uh, as coaches, I think we, I could tell you all the losses mm -hmm. pretty quickly. I mean, we've had a lot of really special wins here and I, I actually don't, you know, kind of think about the, the seasons or years in those terms, but, uh, you know, certainly some of the, some of the Maple championship wins, um, you know, were special being able to win on our home floor in 2014. And, and then, you know, that same year, you know, we beat a very, very good West Town team in the state championship, you know, had an NBA lottery pick on that team. And we just played lights out and we're up 16 at halftime and held on to win. Um, so those those stand out some, but, you know, every win's special. And uh, I don't know that I can rank one above the other, but I could tell you about a lot of losses too. Of course, the losses sting worse than the wins feel good. Yeah, I know that. Uh, who's the best player you've ever coached against? Coached against? Like either the best player or the one that just blew your all socks off the time you played them. Yeah, we played against some really, really good players. Um, I mean, as a – when I came into the league, like one of the first things we had to do was go against the tandem of uh, Charlie Villanueva and Luau Dang at Blair Academy, and I – I was wondering what the heck had I gotten myself into? How are we going to win this league? And, um, you know, those guys were super talented. Um, I'll tell you the guy who shot the ball the best, uh, St. Benedict's came in our gym with J.R. Smith. Mm. And all he did was he just, if we guarded him here, he would take a step back and shoot. And then he'd keep stepping back until you just couldn't believe he was going to fire it. And I think he had about 38 points. And that was probably the most impressive shooting display I saw. Gotcha. Um, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Uh, well, I love playing golf. And um, regrettably, it's April 11th, and I still don't have my clubs back in the car. They're still in the basement. So that's how this year's going. But uh, I, uh, outside of basketball and uh, time with family, yeah, I love to play golf. Okay. And last one, what's your favorite movie of all time? Man, I've got a top five. Give me a couple of those of them. five. Give me your five. 
We'll break I'll it go out. with Rudy. I'll go with Rudy. Okay. Good choice. <laughs> well, Seth, thanks so much for joining us today on the uh, Prep Athletics Podcast. Good catching up with you and appreciate all the knowledge you shared today. Um, if everyone else, if you guys enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe on YouTube. We're on all the major podcasting platforms. Seth listens every other week when they get released. So he's a big fan out there. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Like, you know, if people want to get in touch with you or follow you, you want to share with that, uh, that information with us? Yeah, thanks. We're always, uh, you know, here and, um, you know, the Hill B basketball uh, is on Instagram and Twitter and follow our program there. And uh, if I can ever be a resource for any student athletes and their families, uh, I know they're in good hands with you, Corey, but uh, send them our way. And, um, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about Hill today and about the current landscape of, you know, prep school basketball. It's a, it's a, it's a really great place and, and, you know, life I get to lead here. Um, so it's always fun to talk about it. And I appreciate you having me on. Well, thanks so much. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Thank you, Seth, for joining us. And we'll see you all next time on the Prep Athletics Podcast.